Hi, we'd like to begin today's event with a land acknowledgement. The archaeological research facility is located in Huchin, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Chechenya speaking Ohlone peoples, successors of the historic and sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. We acknowledge that this land remains of great importance to the Ohlone people and that the ARF community inherits a history of archaeological scholarship that has disturbed Ohlone ancestors and erased living Ohlone people from the present and future of this land. It is therefore our collective responsibility to critically transform our archaeological inheritance in support of Ohlone sovereignty and to hold the University of California accountable to the needs of all American, Indian, and Indigenous peoples. So with that, we'll um, begin our event today. Welcome, everyone. Um, we have a special guest today. Uh, Clark Knight is going to be speaking, and uh, Dave Wall from Geography will be introducing her. So take it away, Dave. All right. Thanks, Nico. Um, yeah, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Clark Knight. Um, Clark is a postdoc researcher at USGS in Menlo Park, and she's interested in forest responses uh, to climate change, both past and present. present. Uh, she's primarily worked in California's mixed conifer forests, where disturbance regimes, and particularly wildfire, are driving community composition and, and ecosystem function. Uh, she's a recent graduate from UC Berkeley's PhD program in uh, environmental science, where she leveraged uh, reconstruction techniques from paleoecology to compare modern forests to those from the late Holocene and Euro-American settlement. Uh, and an important aspect of this work, as, as we'll hear about today, uh, was considering and integrating traditional ecological knowledge with paleoproxy data uh, to really enhance our interpretive capabilities. Um, and as I said, she's currently a postdoc at USGS. She's focused on producing well-dated, high-resolution reconstructions of, of past climate to understand climate variability uh, and its impacts on local ecosystems in Western North America, uh, with a particular focus on extreme hydrological uh, events like atmospheric rivers. Um, and so with that, I will turn it over to Clark. Great, thank you so much for that uh, really lovely introduction, Dave. I'm excited to be here with you all and to talk about some of the research that I did while a Berkeley student. Um, hopefully you can see this. Um, let me play from start. Looks good. Okay, thank you. Great, so um, as Dave mentioned, I am a postdoc at the USGS. Um, Dave is my advisor and I'm gonna be presenting some work that I did as a PhD student at Berkeley, specifically um, looking at the historical role of fire in the Klamath Mountains, California. Um, I'm gonna be going through the history of this area as well as the land use history and trying to take a holistic look at what has been happening in this area. I consider myself a paleo ecosystem scientist, so I am really interested in all aspects of the environment and how they change through time. And so this is a picture actually of the Trinity Alps up in this area but it has um, a really beautiful lake highlighted in this photo, which I'm gonna be talking a lot about lakes and the paleo ecological information that can be harnessed from them. So I just wanna plant that seed now. So in this area, if you're not familiar, it's in the Northwestern part of California and it's called the Klamath Siskiyou Bioregion. It also intersects with Six Rivers National Forest. This is a really gorgeous area up in Northern California. Um, it has a lot of mountainous topography. Um, as you can see from the photo on the right, it has a lot of water, um, hence six rivers in the name. And really importantly from a paleoecological standpoint is it has a lot of small lakes. And these are lakes that have been formed from glacier retreat as well as landslides. And there's almost a hundred of these small lakes up in this area. So it's a very um, great area to do this kind of work. And from a floristic standpoint, this bioregion is really, really cool. It has um, the most endemic conifer species outside of the tropics. So that's a really interesting feature of this landscape. There's actually a place called Miracle Mile that has 18 endemic conifers. If you have a chance to go up and see them, and if you're interested in trees, it's a great place to go look at them. And the geology of the area is also uh, really interesting. There's serpentine rocks. This is a, an example from when I was doing field work up there. And this area is, historically speaking, has had 
a pretty different fire regime from what we think about in terms of Southern California. So this might be some review, but I think it's really important to highlight this dichotomy in California with the different fire regimes, because that's played such a huge role in constructing uh, the conditions of these forests. So in Northern California and in the Sierra Nevada, by and large, um, traditionally there would be fire regimes of high frequency uh, and low severity. So there would be fires pretty frequently in, um, in the area, but they wouldn't kill that many trees and the trees are evolved to cope with this um, recurrent fire on the landscape. Um, and in general, in the South, we have a different fire regime where we have more uh, time between fires or lower frequency, but they're usually much higher severity. So for example, we have a vast uh, chaparral landscape in California, it's particularly in, in the south, um, that has crown fire and is burned completely high mortality. Uh, it's a high mortality event when that occurs. So just to kind of get that into your mind, because we're going to see a big deviation in the fire regime, particularly where I worked, uh, and the impact that that has had on the landscape. I'm actually able to quantify some of that impact um, of changes in the fire regime. And so before uh, I get too far deep into my research, I think it's really important to ground this research in an understanding um, of some of the traditional ecological knowledge and publications that have come out of this area. And we know from the oral histories published by many people um, in, this, in this area that there's been a history of forest stewardship. And that has included things um, like cultural burning for um, you know, ceremonial purposes or for you know, clearing trails for crop cultivation, a lot of different reasons why fire has been put on this landscape. In particular, where I worked, um, this map from the Native Land Project has a really nice representation of some of these boundaries of the traditional territory of uh, some of these tribes. So up in this area where I worked, I was really at the boundary between the Yurok tribe and the Karuk. And in fact, some of my lake sites were of um, joint use between the two of them. And some of them were purely in uh, Karuk traditional territory. So there's actually a lot of tribes in this area as you can see from this map, but where my sites were located was really at this intersection um, of the Yurok and the Karuk. And you know, I think it's important to make note that a lot of these practices are ongoing to this day. This is not something that's just relegated to the past. And this is a really nice example from one of my um, collaborators, Dr. Frank Blake, from one of his recent publications. This shows a nice picture of a prescribed cultural burn of bare grass going on um, in this landscape. Okay. So, okay. So with California, California forests, one of the reasons I was really attracted to working in a landscape like this um, is that these forests are vast. They take up something like 33 million acres of California's landscape, and they're really valuable. We like to recreate in them, um, and they also perform a lot of ecosystem services for us. Um, you know, they store carbon, which is a huge part of California's um, climate mitigation goals is to keep California forests as carbon sinks rather than carbon sources. And so they have a lot of um, dimensions to how we interact and use these forests. But I think a lot of what my work is showing is that the forests looked a lot different in the past than they do today. And in fact, they, our forests are very threatened. So the integrity of our forests um, is being threatened by a couple of main uh, drivers, the biggest of which is mega wildfire, as we're probably all familiar with, um, as well as hot drought. And this is just an image of what was happening in September of last year. And um, I'm sure that this will continue this year as well. So these mega fires are uh, basically um, taking out huge areas of forest, causing really high mortality, and in fact, probably leading to type conversion in a lot of these um, previously forested areas. And so why did this occur? Well, a lot of it has to do with fire suppression, which was a mandated federal and state policy used to prevent fires or quickly extinguish them once they started. And when people think of fire suppression, it actually um, began around 1905 when the forest reserve system was created, but it's a lot more than just putting out fire. It was actually the creation of infrastructure. So the roads to get to remote places in California, um, the setup of ranger stations, personnel, equipment, all of these things really coalesced in California to be very, very active and effective at suppressing fire for nearly a, an entire century. And this also led to public communication campaigns as you're probably aware, Smokey the Bear, which did a lot um, to get in the minds of the public about fire being a negative force on the landscape. 
And so just to give a kind of review of some of the conditions that I am thinking about when I, when I talk about these historical landscapes, um, I'm sorry, I hope you can't see this like other beeping thing that's happening on my computer. Um, but with pre-suppression forests, the, the Nature Conservancy has put out a lot of really nice um, graphics about this. And I want you to think of the forest before suppression as much more open th than they are today, much more park-like. So if you were to stand in a forest in the 1800s, you would probably have high visibility around you. You could see 300 meters away. Um, and these conditions really were evolved to handle the um, fire that was coming onto this landscape in a very frequent recurrent way. And so these low severity fires would, would definitely burn and kill some trees, but they wouldn't kill everything. You would still have many healthy, uh, many trees survive and it would produce this healthier forest, forested landscape. But when you have fire suppression for at least a hundred years is you get really dense overstock forests like this, which allows any fire that then comes through to climb up to, through the trees um, burn everything pretty much. And you get this moonscape of a high mortality environment where there is no more forest anymore. And this is creating a really big problem for California because um, the state is using carbon uh, in the forest as part of their climate mitigation strategy. And we can't combat climate change if all that uh, carbon in the forest is just re-released to the atmosphere. So these are some images I took near my field sites you can see just how dense this landscape is. And actually a fire had gone through relatively recently when I was doing field work and you can see, you know, just everything was killed. And these really high mortality post-fire events um, are just undoing a lot of the good that has been done with carbon storage in our forests. So this really gave me the motivation for my um, PhD research, which I'm gonna now get into, um, which is I wanted to understand are there any long-term data sets? Can I even create a data set that's long-term about forest biomass um, and fire to help us get an evidence base for the management decisions that we need to be making in California? Because a big part of California is restoration, but restoration to what? what do, can we quantify anything we want to get back to in terms of historic forest conditions, which are thought to be these more stable um, and healthy and resilient forested systems? So that's what motivated me to work on this. And it led me to this really fabulous field called paleoecology, which I'm now obsessed with. And um, paleoecology does exactly that. It allows you to study uh, past ecosystem processes. And in particular, I've been interested in the last 3000 years or so of California forest um, in this area. And um, you know, I use a lot of different methods to reconstruct what this area might have looked like. I'm going to go through um, the main ones, um, you know, the biggest one probably being pollen. If there's anyone in here that's familiar with that, it's a really powerful technique to reconstruct vegetation, particularly around lake sites, which is where we got our pollen from, um, as well as charcoal from those lake sediments, fire scars from tree stumps tree stumps, and then taking that kind of empirical foundation and combining it with, you know, the really vast and deep and helpful ecolo traditional ecological knowledge from our partners um, at the uh, Karuk and Yurok tribes was became this really powerful narrative for what was happening on this landscape. And I also am going to talk a little bit about the historical inventories and management data sets that are available for this landscape that, again, really informed um, our understanding in a quantitative way what was what was happening. So I'm going to actually talk a little bit about the paleo and the pollen side because I think um, it's you know really interesting and it also allow you to understand what I did a bit better. So pollen is a really powerful tool, like I mentioned, because it acts basically as a time machine. Um, it helps you understand what was happening in the past, and the way it does that is that pollen grains, individual pollen grains, um, are unique typically for a genera of taxa, sometimes down to the species level, but it, it allows you to look under a microscope at a pollen grain and determine uh, what, what um, taxa it came from. And so you can start classifying those pollen grains. As you can see, they come in different shapes and sizes, um, and it allows you to build up this assemblage of taxa on a landscape. And hopefully this video will play. Um, but we are in the spring season, which is big time allergy season. And you can see just how much pollen comes off of one conifer tree, one conifer species here. It's you know trillions and trillions of grains um, of pollen. And if you now imagine an entire landscape 
that has trees on it is just the sheer abundance of pollen on a landscape um, is vast. Most of our atmosphere has pollen in it. And um, what typically happens is that the pollen's purpose is to, of course, pollinate another tree. But what happens is it usually fails. It usually does not pollinate anything at all. And in fact, it ends up in other places like the gutter or the top of your car, or um, in many cases on the surface of a lake, which is really valuable for us paleoecologists. This is where we want it to go. Um, so this is a nice example here from Crater Lake up in Oregon. And you can see the green pollen swirling on the surface of this lake. I really like this photo because it shows the dynamics of the currents. And it also um, kind of suggests uh, the fact that the pollen will be mixed a lot in this lake and then will slowly actually percolate down through the water and become incorporated into the sediments of those lakes, which can then uh, be cored by scientists. So that's the process basically of how pollen gets into lakes and, and why it's valuable. So for my own research, um, we went and got lake cores from uh, seven different lakes up in this area. This is a nice example of one of our lake sites, you can see here, you know, mud and then this blue clay layer transitioning into other mud. Um, and this was exactly what we were hoping to get. We got all these lake sediment cores. It was a really fun experience as well. Um, and I looked at the pollen in these lake cores and helped that helped reconstruct the vegetation. So again, um, the lake sites that I worked in uh, are these blue squares here. And there's been some other work, as I mentioned, because there's so many lakes up up in this area um, from existing papers. So I, I kind of knew going in a little bit about the paleoecological history uh, and that really helped when I was doing my work. So from the pollen record, um, basically what I, what I learned from this was that the vast majority of the pollen from these lake cores came from only a couple of different taxa and specifically pine pollen. So this looks like this Mickey Mouse shape here on the right, um, as well as Douglas fir which looks like this broken Pac-Man, and then this tan oak um, pollen. These are, and as well as other kinds of oaks, but these were the, some of the dominant taxa on the landscape. And what I wanted to do was reconstruct this pollen history um, from these, taken together with some work um, from, done by Jeff Crawford, um, some of his data is look at how this changed in the last 3000 years. So this is one example at our lake, um, a lake called Lake Agarantok, and we found that there was a 3,000 year peak or high in shade tolerant taxa, um, likely due to fire suppression based on what we counted from the pollen. So we can see here the 20th century um, in this little red bracket, and we have 3,000 years of data shown here on the Y axis. And then we have our different taxa ranked by how intolerant or tolerant they are to shade, which is a proxy for um, how fire uh, repellent um, they are. So for example, um, Quercus is very shade intolerant, so it's not going to grow in shady environments. It needs fire usually to keep that shade down, to keep other competition down. Um, and what we found is this really big spike in things like Pseudosugo, so Doug fir, which is a more shade tolerant species, and Nothilothocarpus as well, um, TCT, and even in Aves, so fir. Um, and that was true on the landscape for, you know, most of these species. So there's a signal of increased amount a vegetation on this landscape, which I'm going to get to, as well as in the pollen signal, giving us this longer term view of um, what's been happening, that there's been this spike here in shade tolerant species. Okay, so I'm gonna quickly talk about charcoal. I think it's just an interesting way of looking at past fire events. What charcoal is, is it's incompletely combusted organic matter. It's also found in these lake sediment cores. Um, the difference between macroscopic and microscopic isn't super important. Um, but, you know, there is data about uh, the macroscopic charcoal from this area. And charcoal gets into a lake in a somewhat similar way uh, as pollen does. You know, there's a fire event, it creates charcoal, and it's either lofted into the air and is deposited into a lake, or over time there's surface runoff. So if you get a lake core um, and sample it, you're going to see fire or charcoal in this area because there has been a lot of fire. Uh, it's a high-frequent fire system. So when we look at um, another one of our lake sites, so this is Fish Lake um, up in this area, is we can get kind of a qualitative interpretation of what's going on using um, charcoal accumulation rates, which is the amount of particles per centimeter squared per year. And I have plotted here um, our z-scores of charcoal, so it's standardized, and we have increasing amounts of charcoal going up, decreasing amounts of charcoal going down on our y-axis, 
and it's plotted over 3,000 years. And what I think is interesting, just purely from a qualitative standpoint, is we actually have a peak. Um, we have increasing charcoal uh, through the Little Ice Age. And the Little Ice Age is a period where we have cooler and wetter climate, not a time period that you would necessarily assume with increased fire. So that was pretty um, intriguing. And we looked at one of our other lake sites as well, like Agaramtok, with this kind of data. And again, a similar story where we have increasing and even actually a peak at this lake of charcoal uh, in, through the Little Ice Age. So it's been increasing through time and it peaks in the Little Ice Age and then it drops off drastically um, in the, the 21st century, which would be on the very right hand side of this graph near minus 100. So um, in calibrated years BP. So, you know, again, you see potentially the influence of fire suppression as a reason for this big drop. But this has been really intriguing to us why there was so much accumulation during the Little Ice Age. And we tried to look at this quantitatively. And what we did is we thought about what our ex expectations would be if climate alone was what was driving fire on this landscape. So for example, if you have only climatically driven vegetation change, if you had a hotter and drier climate, like for example, what we have today, um, you probably see more fire on the landscape because fuels are dried out. And um, if there's therefore a fire, it's more likely to burn. And that would lead to forest opening and the promotion of shade intolerant taxa such as oak. And if you contrast that with a correspondingly uh, cooler and wetter climate, you might expect less fire in the landscape because those fuels don't have as much time to dry out and perhaps forest closure and the increase in the amount of shade tolerant taxa. Um, but what if you wanted to try to detect an anthropogenic impact? So if you have human caused vegetation change, it's not just climate alone. In a cooler and wetter climate, you might actually expect to see more fire on the landscape that promotes more forest opening and more shade intolerant taxa. And this is actually what we see in our data set. So in the Little Ice Age, which is really the period for which we can test this the best, um, which lasted through you know, the Middle Ages, 1300 through about 18, or excuse me, after the Middle Ages, 1300s through 1850 AD, uh, we see this exact trend. So we looked at it quantitatively. We did correlations between um, charcoal, uh, the PDSI, which is a polymer drought severity index. It's a measure of how dry the landscape was, as well as vegetation openness or closeness. And what we found was significant and positive correlations between the amount of charcoal in the landscape, so more fire, and how open that vegetation was. It became more open. And this was happening during this period in the Little Ice Age, um, right around this period of about 500 uh, to 100 calibrated years BP. This goes against a pure climatic alone expectation of this landscape. So we thought that this was a really nice finding um, for our data set. It also occurred um, at Lake Agaramtok. I'm just not gonna show that graph, um, but we found the same um, significant and positive correlations. So we wanted to understand a little bit more detail about this fire on the landscape. And so we turn to fire scars, um, which if you're not familiar, they are caused um, by fires that burned at low intensity that injured the bark cells of a tree, but did not actually kill that tree. And so much like tree rings can be dated and cross dated with other trees in an area, um, fire scars can also uh, be dated and cross dated. So you can actually determine past fire events based on fire scars. It's actually a very conservative measure of fire in a landscape. So whenever you look at a fire scar record, I, I like to think that there's probably more fire happening, but it's just not been detected for um, various reasons, which I'd be happy to talk about if anyone's interested in the methodology. So again, at our two lake sites, um, Fish Lake and Lake Agaramtok, is we had these various fire scar sites shown here in red. And they were kind of opportunistically taken where there were um, stumps of trees, but it allowed us to build up this nice data set right around these two lake sites. And we focused on these two lake sites because they were in areas of cultural importance to both the Yurok and the Karuk. So Fish Lake is in an area of joint use between the Karuk and the Yurok, whereas Lake Agaramtok is a sacred lake site um, for the Karuk. So um, we we're really interested in trying to re reconstruct the fire around these two specific lakes. And what we found is that there was really frequent fire. Um, so this is what um, the, the graphic looks like when you count the fire scars. Uh, there's a lot of different tree species that we looked at, but what I really want you to focus on here is the composite here at the bottom, which shows which eat with each of these 
lines, uh, a fire event. As you can see, there was a lot of really frequent fire between the 1700s and the 1900s, and then it completely drops off at, after 1900 when we know fire suppression was happening. And this was true for both of our lake sites. And in fact, when you calculate the median fire return intervals, um, as you see really frequent fire, it's about every seven years at Fish Lake and about every 12 years at Lake Agaromtok. And this work was really led by um, Dr. Eric Knapp, so I wanna give him um, full credit for this. Um, we also found, interestingly, that most of the fire scars were present in the late wood or the dormant wood of the tree ring. Um, we think that this is uh, potentially really interesting, although we need to do more research about um, the fire scar ecology in this specific region of California. But it's kind of tantalizing because a lot of the cultural fire that was being put on the landscape, the indigenous um, ignitions were occurring in the late fall and early spring, according to oral histories and um, current practitioners in this area from the tribes, whereas lightning fire was typically occurring earlier in June and July. So the fact that those scars are kind of aligning with when we might expect indigenous ignitions is just a really tantalizing, though inconclusive um, uh, point from this, this prior scar study. And so, you know, this came up a lot in my work um, and I started to form some views about this, about the paleoecology side and the native stewardship. And, you know, I really settled on this idea and view that I know is echoed in many other papers. I have some nice reading ma uh, material and examples at the bottom here about, you know, it's really important to talk to, listen and learn from the people who have lived in the area um, since time immemorial and particularly in paleoecological research because they are implicated in your findings. Um, and so for our sake, we were really curious about the role that they had in influencing the past um, ecosystem. And we talked to members of the Kruk and the Iraq and included them on our publications to, um, to understand what, their, what the forest stewardship was like. And in particular, we asked questions like, you know, what is the relationship between human ignitions and natural processes, uh, natural or lightning um, ignitions? And, you know, how can we best detect these native actions in the paleo record. Again, coming back to this idea of we want to choose lakes that are culturally significant and we know that they were um, around and using so that we have the best possible chance of, of detecting um, those actions. And it also is important for the interpretation of the data set. So in terms of getting really scientifically sound, um, robust findings, you know, you got to talk to people who know the area. Um, especially when there's implications for today's management actions. And so as part of this process, um, we did what's called a practicing pikyov, which uh, in the Karuk language, that means uh, to fix or to repair. And what was really lucky for me is that being a Berkeley grad student is I had access to the Karuk UC Berkeley Collaborative. And as part of this collaborative, they have set up um, tribal policy, Karuk tribal policy to do a practicing pick up before any kind of research collaboration begins. And so through this practicing pick up, I was able to develop a project with mentors who had worked with um, the Karuk before, members of the Karuk tribe were on my um, research committee, and I presented my proposal to the research um, to the council and they decided to approve my research and I went forward. But what's really powerful about this um, policy is that it gives you mutually agreed upon expectations for the collaboration, as well as protects um, traditional um, intellectual property. It's really helpful during the review process because we went through tribal reviews. So everyone who um, wanted to be a part of the project was able to give feedback. It informed our research design. Uh, it informed the presentation of our results. So it was really a powerful process for, for producing um, a scientific uh, product. So really proud and happy about our collaboration there. And I wanna contrast this um, with some other work that's come out in the paleo environment because it's been contentious in the field, actually, this role of indigenous fire on the landscape. You may be familiar with this paper last year from Nature um, that came out that, that says emphatically in their paper that um, the charcoal and pollen data and the archaeological record do not support the interpretation of significant indigenous impact. And they actually make some conservation recommendations based on this finding that um, there should not be fire in the landscape today. You, they should instead do chainsaws, cattle and sheep grazing and hay production. So this is exactly what I'm talking about. The significance of um, you know, indigenous fire may or, not, may or may not being on the landscape 
uh, has real conservation uh, impacts. And so what was interesting about this work is that they did not, um, excuse me, they did not um, consult or talk to any of the tribes in this area. Actually in the area of New England where they worked, there was something like 21 different tribes and so, you know, this really raised a flag to me is, and this is a controversial area, but I really think talking to people um, and bringing them on board would potentially give you a different result. But this has been controversial in California as well, not just New England. So for example, um, a couple of different papers have published on this and said that um, burning activities, for example, in Whitlock at all, um, burning activities from, you know, um, Native people are unknown and probably limited. Um, I'm not sure how you get from unknown to probably limited. I, I don't think you can draw that connection necessarily. Um, and then there was a whole book about it um, published by Vail um, in 2002 that uh, basically says there's no not been significant change on the landscape um, and not been significant landscape modification with fire before colonization. Um, so my findings are in stark contrast to this, but I wanted to put out there that there has been um, other findings or in, in other publications um, about this controversial topic. Um, and there's been pushback as well. So more recently in the literature, um, Leonard et al, Armstrong, um, Armstrong et al have raised questions that I think I've been asking as well of, you know, how do you, why, why weren't indigenous scholarship uh, scholars included or consulted? Um, you know, what relevant oral or historical history was or was not included. Um, and then also this point about the spatial scale of what was reconstructed. That's a really not, uh, important point when you talk about um, what can be done from the paleoecological side is a lot of what you're doing is really constrained to a certain lake or a group of lakes. And so how much can that be interpolated to a landscape um, is another really important question to consider. So lastly, I'm going to um, talk about um, some of the findings from the traditional ecological knowledge as well. If I, if I have time, some of the historical inventories, if not, I'll leave that part off. Um, but we had a lot of information from scholars in this area about the kinds of indigenous stewardship that was going on in the Klamath. So we know, for example, that people have been there since at least the terminal Pleistocene. And we know that there was really sophisticated application of fire technology um, by the tribes in this area, which are ongoing to this day. And specifically, um, you know, the native history suggests the substantial contribution to the fire regime. And at our lake sites, Agarantok and Fish Lake, we know from um, we know from members of this tribe that both sites were gathering places for acorns and mushrooms and that they um, needed these low level, low fuel levels, low biomass, these open forest conditions to actually cultivate the kind of crops that they were interested in. And some work from the 1970s speculates that there are about two to 3000 people before colonization. Um, so that just gives an idea of how many people you would be needing to feed from, from these crops. It's, it's quite a few people. Um, in the contemporary, um, Dr. Frank Lake has done um, an oral history from members of the Karuk and Yurok tribe in his dissertation work that we were able to draw on. And what he found um, is that from tribal members, they already know that their traditional lands are really over enriched in biomass. They know that the forest is super dense. And in fact, they compare it to, um, quote, an ecological and cultural desert. This came out of some work from um, Berkeley professor um, Sauerwein a couple of years ago. And in fact, one of the Kruk elders that um, Dr. Frank Lake interviewed said that we quote, we've never had this much fuel on the ground. So there's already this convergence between the empirical side about the ahistorical peaks in biomass um, on this landscape with uh, what the traditional ecological knowledge and oral history is saying. So it's a really nice consistency. And I just wanna make mention here that indigenous burning also isn't a monolith. Uh, monolith. And in the Klamath, there's something like um, 70 uses of fire that have been on the landscape. Um, and that kind of pyrodiversity really supported a mosaic of vegetation types. So um, this really homogenous dense forest is again, super ahistorical in this context. So those kinds of different fire were developing and evolving over time. And you know, one example of this is um, the Tulawat pattern, which um, occurred about 1500 BP onwards was this time period of more migration into the Klamath area from the north, 
and more intensive land usage and very likely more burning. So this is this is a really fascinating area and there's you know a lot of history just in um, what happened with uh, the burning trends. Um, I think I'm getting close on time, but I, I will just quickly talk about what I some of my findings from the colonial era because it's this transition point between the late Holocene and indigenous led management to Euro-American management uh, that it continued through the modern period. Um, what's really interesting is that there's ecological data from this period from the public land survey data. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but I'm gonna talk about it. It's this, it's really nice written record of what um, the, the forests and um, the kinds of trees that were on the landscape but this is a really important period, the colonial era, because it does mark, um, as I said, this transition, but particularly the um, before period, before fire suppression. So it gives you this glimpse into what the forest might have looked like, um, more of a snapshot really than anything from these 20th century um, changes that were coming. And so I like to use this image of what the forest potentially looked like, because this is a real picture from up in um, the area that I worked from 1910. Um, and back a hundred years later, it's the same lake and you can see just how much more dense it is around this lake. Um, so that was the main question I came into this work with was what did this forest look like in the 1880s, which is when the public land survey was completed. And in case you're not familiar, this actually occurred over much of the US everywhere where you see these colors is where the public land survey took place. Um, and it, so it had this regional coverage in California, um, which is really nice. And it, um, what happened is that you'd have people going out um, who would take field notes and they would document in a really um, specific way the kinds of trees and their size and their location on the landscape. And so what I was able to do as I calculated, I think it was about 21,000 trees were in my data set by the time I got through um, extracting the tree records. And I was able to find this really big structural change on the landscape. So if you look at what was collected in this historic data set shown in black, versus the contemporary, as you can see that on our y-axis with density is that it really, really increased in this area. It's about three times more dense than it was um, in the historic period. And the same goes for the basal area of this landscape. So that again, really just consistent with what we would expect um, based on the oral history and the ecology of this area after fire suppression. And there was also a lot of compositional change based on this data set. So again, the historic in black and the contemporary in gray, the relative dominance of different taxa by basal area changed a lot. So we have this increase in basal air and Douglas fir from about 34% of the landscape in the historic period to almost 45%. Um, pines were actually about the same, but really dramatic change in the oak taxa where you had a lot more oaks on the landscape, something like 21% of landscape was oaks in this area in the 1880s. But unfortunately that's dropped to about 9%. Um, in the contemporary period. So this huge oak loss, which has been documented um, around California as well. So um, that gives us a really nice quantitative view as well of this landscape. And when you look at the fire records from Cal Fire, um, you can see the really effective uh, fire suppression in this area. So this is all the wildfires that occurred in Six Rivers since 1908. And you can see that in terms of area burned in hectares is there was almost no fire uh, in the 20th century. And then of course that's changed a lot in the last 20 years, but that really aligns with um, the policies that we knew were occurring. So just to sum up here, these results, there's about three times more trees on the landscape today than there was in 1880. And these modern forests contain a lot more dug fir and less oak, but about the same amount of pine. And that this fire suppression is, is probably driving the densification in this area. Um, so I think I'm probably not gonna have time to go through this, unfortunately, so I, we can get some questions, but um, what we recently did in, in an article was combine all of the different um, methods that I just talked to you through, and we were able to synthesize and produce this biomass record um, for the area over 3000 years and really show this strong impact and indigenous influence um, of keeping the, the um, biomass levels really low in this area. Um, again, this is what a low biomass forest looked like versus a high biomass one, and that there was a really long pattern of this, at least a thousand years of low biomass before the modern period here on the right. Um, and in fact, it's about half of what it was um, today. So the median tree biomass until colonization was about 100 megagrams per hectare, 
um, than in colonization, we see the skyrocketing of biomass, and it's about double that on the landscape today. I'm just going to skip this slide um, and just present our main findings with all of this work. So, you know, we, we went through it all these different methods and, you know, the Karukan ethnographic data is super vital about these wider watersheds. And that coupled with the fire scar and charcoal history suggests that indigenous stewardship really strongly contributed to the fire regime um, on this landscape. Our biomass records and the records um, from the 1880 public land survey also suggest that frequent fire um, limited the biomass on this landscape relative to how productive these sites can be. We see today really high levels of biomass and that the consistency between um, our biomass record and these other independent lines of evidence is strong and it gives us more um, confidence in, in these results. And so I think going forward, if we can integrate paleo and ethnographic records, that can be a really powerful way of understanding um, the ecology of the past. And particularly in California, when so much of our contemporary forest is unprecedented in at least 3000 years, um, that becomes really important for restoration ecologists. And going forward, I think indigenous forest and fire management will be critical to maintaining forest conditions, not only those conditions before colonizations, but helping to restore and have any kind of historical fidelity um, with the landscape of the past. And so this is um, basically saying the same thing, um, but just increasing engagement with tribes and the fact that we will probably need a very large scale intervention if we want to achieve historical um, fidelity um, and also to temper our expectations about how much carbon we can realistically store in the landscape for a long period of time. So I want to say thank you to my collaborators and co-authors, um, my funding sources, and to you for listening. And I hope I have time to take some questions. Thank you. All right, thank you, Clark. Um, I guess before we move on to questions, I'll point out uh, for those of you who are interested in this and want to find out more, um, we just had a paper come out two weeks ago, I should say Clark had a paper come out in PNAS that um, covers all of this. And so if you wanna do a deeper dive and look into some of the data, it's all there. Um, do we have any questions? Hey, uh, Dave, hey, great to see you. This is Kent Lightfoot. Can I, ha I have a, uh, actually two quick questions. Sure. Uh, Clark, that was a really fabulous talk. Great, great uh, presentation. So uh, my question is, you got very good evidence that we've got, uh, you know, a little ice age. There's definitely uh, successive yeah. cultural burning going on and continuing. When, when do you think it actually starts? That is, you obviously, you've got a 3,000 year window is it yeah. is is it it's obviously looks like it's late Holocene, but is there do you see uh, like a uh, when you really begin to see the, the the cultural burning taking place? Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, I, it cut yeah. out. Oh, sorry, it cut out for me. Um, yeah, that's a great question. I think actually, if I go back maybe to um, this figure. I think, unfortunately, it's a bit inconclusive, but, mm -hmm. um, and that's, again, a, I think a bit muddled because the medieval climate warming, we would expect more fire in the landscape just from how hot and dry it is. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, you do see it pick up in the Little Ice Age. I wish we could conclusively say oh, it's been going on for several thousands of years, according to our record, but where it really stands out was the Little Ice Age from you know, the oral history, as far as my understanding, um, is those, you know, they're not geologically dated. So unfortunately, I, there's not that kind of specificity um, from, from that kind of record. Um, so I think, unfortunately, it's, it really is just inconclusive. Um, but my guess is that if it was happening in the Little Ice Ages, that it probably had to be developed by those people before mm -hmm. then as well. So it is a tantalizing kind of like it, it was probably happening um, much further um, beyond that as well. Yeah, well, that's good. Hey, my second question is, Joe, so what are you doing with the USGS right now? You know, what's your, what's your current, current research? Are you still doing this kind of research? Um, I am still doing this kind of research and I'm also broadening a bit. So as you can see, this talk focused a ton on carbon. 
which I, I love thinking about carbon in California. I'm also bringing in water now as another main um, piece of my work. So with Dave and others in his lab, um, we're looking at atmospheric rivers and how they might be um, present in the geologic record, again, using lake sediments as one of our ways of detecting this. So um, atmospheric rivers, carbon, um, and as well as continuing to work with and build bridges with tribal um, communities is definitely part of my portfolio right now. Excellent. Hey, well, anyway, great job. Great, uh, oh, really great so talk. Thank, thank you, you very so much. much. Okay, it sounds like Junko has a question about uh, about oaks. Oh, um, yes. Um, please ask it. Um, thank you very much for a really interesting uh, presentation. I work on uh, prehistoric archaeology in Japan, where okay. um, the issue of uh, um, the use of acorns is okay. a major topic. And one of the things that I'm very curious about is the uh, calcus being uh, shade intolerant plants, because um, Japanese archaeologists used to think that, well, acorn processing, wild food, uh, <clears throat> no need for management. But I think the more we learn about um, ecology and also many people started to work on slash and burn agriculture and uh, burning the field, um, we realized that, okay, in order to maintain uh, <clears throat> um, the harvest of acorns, to what extent people needed to do environmental management. So my question okay. is, um, to what extent burning, and I think it's kind of tied to Ken's question, um, how far the um, evidence of burning goes back and does that correspond yeah. to an increased use of uh, acorns as a staple food in uh, your research area? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, thank you so much for asking it. I think it probably must be tied to it because we know that um, you know, tan oak was used for acorns. There's actually several other species of, of oak in this area that were important for um, foodstuffs. So, you know, talking to some Kruk members today is that they did try to cultivate these um, acorns right around the lakes. And, you know, we did find evidence of very frequent burning from our fire scar record from taken from tree stumps right around these lakes as well. So I, I imagine so. And, you know, given that we think there are several thousand people at least um, as part of these communities with villages probably scattered and you know many of these you know prime locations with water access points is that there probably is a huge tie there with fire and, and acorns. One of the downsides of this work, although we had a lot of resolution from using these two culturally significant lakes, is that it's unclear exactly how far out to extrapolate this information. We think there's reason to believe that this would be happening in a in similar places um, throughout this area, but just in terms of like the spread of how far it would be, it's a bit un unclear. Um, we think at least a kilometer, this, this work would be true for at least a kilometer around each of our lake sites based on some other modeling work that we've done. So um, it's not a very satisfying answer to your question, but I do agree that if there was a lot of people and they were putting fire in landscape and they did use these acorns, um, that they're going to be cultivating Quercus using fire, but just how far back that goes, it's pretty inconclusive from the evidence we have right now in terms of the Thank time. You. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Like Do we, any more questions here? All right. Well, uh, thank you once again, Clark. That was a really interesting talk. Um, thank you so much for having me. And thank you, Arf, for hosting. Sure. Thank you. Um, I wanted to quickly mention that today at 2 p.m., one of our grad students, A.J. White, is offering a, a workshop on paleoclimate databases. Those databases oh. are the one hosted by NOAA. And I'll go ahead and paste the link to the Zoom in the chat here. So if anybody's interested in joining us in one hour, this is the A.J.'s workshop. Hey, Nico, someone's asking if a video of the talk will be available. Um, yeah, I'll post this on our YouTube channel um, in, you know, within a week or so. Mm -hmm. Great. All right, fantastic. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for a great talk. Yeah. Oh, thank Good. you.